نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا نسرات المستقيم سرات الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد بارك سم صل عليه صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, continuing our talk about Musa alayhi salam uh, I've been told that I say you know too much uh, so I'm going to try to stop doing that um, I assume that people know uh, which sometimes I assume incorrectly even though most of what we're talking about most people have a background to this and the only problem is that uh, many of the perspectives and especially because of imperial um, forces and, and uh, people changing perceptions uh, especially through various ideologies you know it's caused problems and issues so we're trying to give a different perspective here or rather a more traditional perspective on things inshallah one thing that I should have mentioned in the beginning and I mentioned this, or I've said the term a lot, which without really defi defining the term, you know, saying Bani Israel, or the children of Israel, uh, or children of Israel. Uh, Israel is the name of Yaqub al -Islam, or one of the names of Yaqub al -Islam. And so he had, of course, 12 sons, and from each son you had clans that, that formed, and so these are the 12 tribes, and these are what are known as the children of Israel. So being from the children of Israel is not something that you can adopt. Uh, this is something that you are born into. Uh, so, you know, conversion was not a thing initially. So that's important to understand. Musa al-Islam, uh, among the prophets that were sent to the children of Israel, uh, is somewhat different in that he was, uh, you know, in being sent to the children of Israel, he was also sent to Pharaoh and his people. However, the requirements from each group were different. Uh, he was mainly sent to the children of Israel as a prophet, but he was also sent to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh, all the people of Pharaoh had to do was accept him, and that would be it, and free the children of Israel. Uh, there was no other obligations on them, and they weren't even willing to do this. So, you know, last time we spoke about the verse, and we spoke about which is verse 157 of Surah Araf. Because every prophet told their people about the coming of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Musa Al-Islam also told, told the children of Israel about this, uh, but he also cho told Firaun and his people about the coming. And so this is why they knew. And this is why, you know, Rasulullah is mentioned not only in in the older books, but as as that verse, uh, verse 157, Allah SWT states that also the, the changes that they've made to the books, still the mention of Rasulullah is still there for those who wish to see. And so even other cultures, you know, had an idea of the coming of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course that verse starts off with Alladina Yattabiuna Rasula Yattabiuna Rasula Nabi al Ummi. And as we mentioned last time, Nabi al Ummi, which unfortunately gets translated as unlettered prophet, you know, has many meanings that are correct. However, unlettered and illiterate are not one of those correct meanings. Uh, Rasulullah is from Umm al Qura, which is one of the meanings. Umm al Qura, the mother of cities, uh, which of course is Makkah. And the verse ends with, you know, after Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about the authority that he is that he sent Rasulullah with, 
you know, to make things halal and to make things haram. You know, he is shair. Uh, he is not. He did not only come with the Sharia, but he also came with the authority to make the Sharia. Uh, so you know, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says also in, in in another place in the Quran, "Wama ataakum al-Rasulu fakhudu, wama naha wama nahaakum anhu fantahu." That whatever the Messenger gives you, take it, and whatever he uh, uh, tells you to abstain from, stay away from it. You know, again, this is the authority. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with not only with the message but he himself is the message with the authority to to decide you know what is good for the nation or for his people and what is not you know, and whatever he says is good is good and whatever he says is bad is bad period he is the definition of good and the you know and he himself is good and he is the definition and the ex and the manifestation of good and so whatever is associated with him in a good way is good and whatever he turned his turned away from is bad and this is an important point to understand uh, because there are people who challenge his his authority uh, they'll use various incidences and we'll talk about those later inshallah where they try to show oh see rasulullah sallam he he didn't have any authority astaghfirullah and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَىٰ That whatever he says is nothing except revelation. He doesn't say anything from himself. So every sound that he utters is nothing but revelation. You know, and the verse ends with, for those who accept the authority of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And then they honor him and support him and, and defend that honor. You know, it's not simply, okay, you know, I honor him, but somebody else is insulting him or, or challenges, challenging his knowledge, you know, saying that he didn't have the knowledge of the unseen or challenging, you know, even the thought of Rasulullah Sussan that to think of him in Salat, you know, it would have been better to think of some four-legged animal or stuff for Allah. I mean, these are things that are literally written, you know, not just said by certain people, but written by certain people. You know. Or they say, oh, you know, he didn't have the authority to even uh, break a, uh, a twig in two. That's the Allah. Or that he didn't know what was on the other side of the wall. So when, you know, to honor him also means to defend his honor. And not to respect or honor those people who challenge these things. But actually to confront them. You know, for them, in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ That those are the ones who are successful. So if we expect to be successful, you know, not just in the hereafter, but also in this world, then we need to make sure that we defend in on the honor and the respect of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We left off last time where Musa al-Islam is ordered to go and, and to take the people by night or take the children of Israel by night out of Egypt. You know, so they're going to do this even though you know, the Egyptians, Pharaoh and his, or Pharaoh and his people have not freed them, he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the order just take them. You know, but along with that order is the order also to take the body of Yusuf al-Islam along with him. And as we said last time, the only one among the children of Israel who were in Egypt who knew or remembered where Yusuf al-Islam was buried was this old woman. Yeah. And we talked about the old woman of Nu al-Islam and her iman. And now we talk about the understanding and the iman of, the, of this old woman of Musa al-Islam. So, so Musa al-Islam is ordered to go and ask her. And again, an important point to understand here is that Musa al-Islam, you know, you cannot put the knowledge of the Ummati or the follower above the Nabi or above the, uh, the, the Prophet sent to that nation. The Prophet has more knowledge than all of his following combined. Period. So, you, so anyone who thinks that Musa al-Islam didn't know and this woman knew uh, I mean, is not thinking straight. Musa al-Islam knew. Uh, 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show the status of this woman to the people, of, to, to her people, to, to the nation, to the children of Israel. Uh, because if somebody says, well, if Musa, Musa al-Islam knew, then why didn't he go do it himself? Or why didn't he just go and go to the grave himself? Well, then why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just tell him where to go? It would have been easier if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just, if Musa al-Islam didn't know, it would have been easier if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just told him, okay, go here and, and dig up you know, the grave of Yusuf al-Islam and take him with you. Why did he send her to the woman? Again, because he wants to show the people her understanding. Yeah, we get similar incidences during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A simple example of this where, where Rasulullah sallallahu wants to show the people the status of, of a certain person among them. And, you know, one simple example of this is when Rasulullah sallallahu was returning from Tabuk uh, on the way back from the expedition, uh, they ran out of supplies, food supplies. They were out of food. Uh, and it was at least a 20-day journey back to Medina Munawwara. So some of the companions, they came and asked Rasulullah Sallallahu permission to start slaughtering the camels. And Rasulullah Sallallahu granted that permission to them. And so when Omar Radiyan hears about this, he comes running to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu you know, you've given permission for them to slaughter the camels. He said, yes, I have. And he says, you know that if we do this, we'll, be, we'll, we'll have killed all of the camels or slaughtered all of the camels by the time we get back to Medina Munawwara. Now, this is also interesting, you know, Omar Radio understands who Rasulullah is. He didn't say to him, don't you know that we'll be out of camels? He says, you know that we will be out of the camels by the time, you know, we'll have slaughtered our, all of our camels. Rasulullah says, yes. He says, Omar Radio says, Ya Rasulullah stop them. So Rasulullah Sassam asks Omar Radio, he says, Ya yeah, Omar, oh Omar, then you tell me what to do. Rasulullah Sassam isn't asking Omar this because he doesn't know what to do. He already knows what to do. He's asking Omar Radio this because he wants everybody to, else to understand how Omar Radio understands the, the, the Messenger of Allah. How he honors and respects and understands or his understanding of the status of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Umar Radio, he says to Rasulullah Sallallahu you know, and the hadith is in Riyadu Salih, I don't remember if it's in Bukhari or Muslim, but it's, it's there. And it's a say hadith. Umar Radio says to Rasulullah Sallallahu he says, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu He says, have a sheet spread in front of you and ask everybody to bring whatever they have left the crumbs and the soot, you know the the everything that they have left of food you know whatever little bit it is have them place it in in front of you on the sheet and then you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that will be enough for us it will suffice us So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has a sheet spread in front of him and he orders everybody to bring whatever they have left. Yeah, and it's just, you know, a small pile is placed in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, crumbs and just, you know, a few things. Not enough to feed a 30,000 man army. Not even feed them once. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raises his hands and he makes the dua. And he orders everybody to come and, and fill their, their pots and, and vessels with food. And those, so the, everybody comes back and now they're starting to take everything into uh, their pots and bags and whatever. And all of the utensils are full and there is still food on the sheet. And all of this food sufficed them until they reached back to Medina Munawwara. This is also part of the, the basis for when we place the food in front of us when we, make fa when we do Fatiha. So again, Rasulullah Sassam knew, but he wanted everybody else to understand the understanding of Umar. 
radiyallahu And so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the nation or the children of Israel to understand the understanding of this woman, the intelligence of this old woman. And so when Musa al-Islam comes to her and he asks her, he says, you know, I've been ordered to ask you the whereabouts of the grave of Yusuf al-Islam. And so she asks him, she says, what are you going to give me for this? You know, information is not cheap. It's not free. You know, it has a price. So Musa al-Islam says, you know, whatever you want, you know, I'm commanded to ask you. And if, if you have a price for it, then whatever you ask. She says to him, she says that I want Jannah. And the intelligence of this woman. She says, I want Jannah, but not just any Jannah. He says, I, she says, I want to be in Jannah at the level that you will be in Jannah, Musa. Uh, Musa al-Islam hears this and he's kind of taken aback and he says, well, you know, he starts thinking that, you know, prophets, you know, there are different levels and, and the prophets are going to be at such high levels in, in paradise and, you know, then the followers will be, you know, below them and, and so how can she be with me in Jannah or with, would be at my level in Jannah? So now Musa al-Islam asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya Allah, this is what she wants. She's not willing to tell me until, or she's not willing to divulge the information until, you know, I promise her this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells her, give it to her. Or tells him, tells Musa, so give it to her. So he says, Ya Allah, you know, the prophets will be at such high levels in the following. He's, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa al Islam, well, the, uh, the prophets will have people with them. They will have their lovers and their followers with them. Al Maru man you know, the lover will be with the one that he loves. You know, and, and they will have their servants with them and everybody else who, who, who will be honored in their presence. So give it to her. So Musa al-Islam comes to her and he says, deal's done. You know, I give you Jannah at my level. And so now he, she tells him where Yusuf al-Islam is buried. Rasulullah sallam he refers to this after the battle of Hunain in which you know more spoils of war were accumulated than any other battle before far more spoils of war you know after Hunain you had 6000 prisoners of war 24,000 camels, 40,000 goats and sheep, 4,000 ounces of silver, gold, arms, armor, a lot of other stuff. And Rasulullah Sassam, he starts handing this out just so freely. You know, Abu Sufyan, he comes to him and he says, Ya Rasulullah Sassam, he says, you know, this is after he has accepted Islam, he says, Ya Rasulullah Sassam, you have become the richest man in Arabia. He asks him, what do you want from this? He says, whatever you give. Rasulullah Sassam tells Bilal radiallahu he says, give him a hundred camels and forty ounces of silver. And Abu Sufyan, he says, what about my son Yazid? Because one of his son's name was Yazid. This is not that Yazid who killed Imam Hussein al-Islam. This is a Yazid who is a companion of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi He said, what about my son Yazid? He says, he tells Bilal, give him the same. He said, what about my son Mawiyah? And he, again, Rasulullah Sallallahu tells Bilal, give him the same. Uh, Safwan bin Umayyah, who was not even Muslim at that time. He kept, he, he had loaned Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi or rented Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi a hundred suits of armor for this battle. You know, to give to his, his soldiers. So he came along because he wanted to make sure that he got back you know, what he had loaned or what he had rented. And he kept looking at this land that all of this stuff was being kept on. And Rasulullah he comes to him, he says, do you like this land? He said, yes. He said, it's yours. 
And this is when he accepts Islam because now he understands because before this they were all under this impression that this is some, you know, thing of kingdom. That Rasulullah was trying to establish some type of kingdom. And now he understood kings don't give like this. So word spreads far and wide hmm, that Muhammad وسلم, he gives in such a way that he's not afraid of becoming poor. You know, even kings, worldly kings, when they give, you know, they're always looking at what they have left behind. Hmm? You know, they're always, you know, they're giving, but they're measuring what they're giving. They don't want to give you too much. You know, otherwise you might end up with more than they have. Or there'll be, you know, a shortage in their supplies. And so people start coming from everywhere asking, Ya Rasulullah, I need this, I want this, 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 and whatever. You know, this is the court of Rasulullah Sallallahu the king of, of this world and the next. The one who Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has sent with the authority. He has, the one for whom Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala created everything else. So this is when a Bedouin comes to Rasulullah Sallallahu and Ali Radio is the narrator and he's there. And this bad one, he comes to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and he says, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu I need you to fulfill, you know, I've come to ask you to fulfill my need. And Ali Radio, he says that the Jamal of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi shifted to Jalal in this emotional state that he went into. And he says to this bad one, he says, ask for whatever you need and it will be given to you. And Ali Radio, he was he says that I was so envious of that man at that time because I knew that he would ask for everything that this world contains and the next and it would be given to him. And he says, I was wishing that I was that man at that time. You know, where Rasulullah has asked with such an emotion that you ask for whatever you need and it will be given to you. And the man, he says, you know, I need four sheep and a couple of camels and this and that. And that was it. And Rasulullah Sassam comes back to that Jamal, to that beauty. Of course, even the emotional state is, is nothing but beauty. Uh, Rasulullah Sassam is nothing but beauty and perfection. He is the perfection of beauty and the and the beauty of perfection. And when he comes back to the normal state, he says to the man, he says that you asked me for less than what the old woman asked from Musa alayhi salam. Because it was the right of Rasulullah sallam, that he should have been asked for more than what this old woman had asked from Musa. Uh, because of his status. Uh, it's like, you know, if, you, if you're asking from a billionaire, you don't ask for a couple of bucks. Because you know that the billionaire has the, author, has the, has the wherewith to be able to give you much more. If you're asking from, you know, the common guy, you're going to ask, oh, I need a couple of bucks. But if you're asking from somebody who, ha who, who has been given everything, you ask for much more. And so it was the right of Rasulullah Sallallahu that he should have been asked for more than what this old woman asked from Musa. Salam. But, you know, the Bedouin only asked for a few things, so he told Ali Radha, he says, give it to him. I'll end here today. We didn't make much uh, headway as far as the story of Musa al-Islam, but we'll get into that next time, inshallah. But, you know, these connections are very important, and these connections are really why the stories are told in the Qur'an. And if we can't make those connections with Rasulullah sallallahu and his family, uh, we have no understanding. Yeah. There is no understanding of the Qur'an without the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There is no understanding of the Qur'an without Rasulullah sallallahu because he is the Qur'an. You know, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand uh, and uh, inshallah we'll pick up from here next time. 
اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا سيدنا مولانا محمد مبارك سم سلواني يا الله allow us to understand the status of of your beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to honor that and to respect him and to uh, and to defend his honor as we should do uh, and allow us to fill our hearts with his love and the true love of yourself and his, and the true love of your beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his family his companions and all of those whom you love allow us to fulfill the rights of this month of Ramadan it has gone gone by so much quicker uh, than usual uh, and allow us to uh, uh, to gain the benefits from this month so that we can feed our souls uh, for the next uh, 12 months until Ramadan comes again uh, and allow us to uh, worship you the way you should be worshipped and, and to uh, honor and love those whom you love and raise us up in a condition where you are pleased with us, where you and your hab Habib وسلم, are pleased with us, and we are pleased with you and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa sallallahu taala ala khairu khalqihi Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa barakatuh.